coming to you from our Eros Park studios on a rainy Friday evening in the capital. And this is the Friday edition of Primetime News. Many thanks for joining me for this last week's edition of Primetime News as we bring context to the events shaping the domestic, regional and global fronts. I'm Michael Madimba. We begin in the capital with 21 political parties participating in the upcoming presidential and parliamentary elections signed off the Code of Conduct at the Electoral Commission of Namibia office earlier today. In a de democracy, it is imperative that we foster an environment where free and fair elections can take place without intimidation, harassment or misinformation. Of late, the Commission has observed deliberate acts of misinformation and allegations made to tarnish our image and spark distrust. It is not only de detrimental for our electoral democracy, but for our beautiful country as a whole. We should all join hands here to stop the spread of fake news and disinformation. It is my firm belief that this code of conduct will lay the groundwork for healthy political competition. Now, on to our second story. Trade Union Congress of Namibia, or TUCNA, and the African Regional Organization of the International Trade Union Confederation earlier today agreed to advance the interests of the continental workforce to foster sustainable development and ensure that the benefits of economic growth as well as the African continental free trade area regime benefits them. We want to involve trade unions in all ongoing trade, uh, trade uh, policies. Again, we will be relying very strongly on government. And when we say all trade policies, Namibia has trade, uh, uh, the, uh, the Africa Growth, Opportun uh, Growth Opportunities Act, AGOA, which Namibia uh, is, uh, is part of. We want to see that in that trade policy, there is good inclusion of workers' uh, 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 voices. On the economic partnership agreement, uh, inclusively, we want to see very in, uh, strong inclusion of, of workers. Why do we want inclusion of workers? Not just so that we, we, we stand as stubborn block, but we argue that trade uh, can only happen because you trade on goods and services. It can only happen because workers are the one producing goods and services. They are the heart of the production of goods and services. If you want to make the issues and the processes involved in production of goods and services and the trade of goods and services, including when you talk about the movement of goods, logistics, uh, drivers behind the wheels, those are workers. They are the ones behind uh, it that are making it uh, happen. The issue is simple to say that there is no trade without workers. And uh, quite long that we have regarded trade union to be only about salaries and picketing and whatever. Trade union across the globe have moved beyond that. Every aspect that that affect a human life is a trade union issue. The Namibia Police Force Deputy Inspector General of Administration Major General Anne Marie Nainder has failed in a bid to become the next International Criminal Police Organization or Interpol Vice President for Africa. More context from this report. Interpol held the 92nd session of its General Assembly elections in Glasgow, Scotland from 4 to 7 November 2024. Namibia, Morocco and Benin were vying for the Vice Presidency of Africa with Major General Nainda as one of the candidates. Nampol spokesperson Deputy Commissioner Kona Shikwambi said in a statement on Thursday that Nainda lost out in a closely contested election. The Director of Judicial Police of Morocco, Mohamed Dikhisi, was elected as the new Vice President of Interpol for Africa. Shikwambi said the General Assembly was attended by global police chiefs from 178 member states out of 196 and concluded with the election of the Executive Committee. Nine positions in the Interpol Executive Committee were filled during the Assembly. Nainda attended the General Assembly by virtue of being the Interpol Delegate for Africa. Shikwambi said despite the outcome of today's vote, Major General Nainda remains a delegate for Africa in the Executive Committee of Interpol. We now switch our attention onto the global scene. 
Russia's President Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump indicated on Thursday that they were ready to hold talks after the Republican tycoon emerged as the victor in the race for the White House. AFP has more. Russia's President Vladimir Putin congratulated Trump in remarks to the Valdai Forum in the southern city of Sochi after Trump defeated Democratic Vice President Kamala Harris in Tuesday's election. Asked whether he was open to holding talks with Trump, the Russian leader said, ready. Trump revealed he was also prepared for some kind of conversation, telling NBC News in an interview that he thinks they will speak as the topic turned to his contacts with world leaders since his victory was announced. Trump said he had spoken to probably 70 world leaders since Wednesday morning, but revealed that he had not talked to Putin, who had claimed with a weary smile that he wanted Harris to win. The endorsement was not taken at face value as Moscow has long been seen as welcoming Trump's anti-establishment credentials and the chaos he has injected into American and global politics. Your talk roundup is up next with a business segment thereafter. Welcome to the Primetime Beast segment, your leading source for all updates, business and economics. A swak of uranium has constructed a computer room and donated 20 computers to the Matutura Secondary School in Swakopmund. Different speakers during the handing over of the donation on Thursday noted the donation is aimed at bridging the digital divide and empowering Namibia's youth through technology. The fully-fledged computer room with internet is valued at over 607,000 Namibian dollars. Irongo Governor Neville Andre Itope hailed the gesture by Swakop Uranium as a transformative moment for education in the region. We are gathered here to celebrate a pivotal moment in our education journey. One of that marked a bold step towards preparing our young people for the future, a future driven by technology, innovation, and digital literacy. Today, we witness the, the fruition of a noble vision to ensure that every Namibian child, no matter where they are, has access to the tools and resources they need to thrive in this digital age. Matutura Secondary School's principal, Leonie Raid, recounted the school's journey from operating under a platoon system at another school to its own current state with over a thousand learners. The learners does not eat meals, so I've had one-on-ones for them. It's a big project for me to find out from all the learners what is going on in their private lives because our learners are very proud. They don't want to you know, reveal what is going on at home. So, having said that, I know it hasn't started yet, Swakop Uranium, thank you so much for the other part of the donation that's still coming, and that is the boundary wall up to a certain point, because it will also ensure that these learners are feeling safe in this environment called Matatura Secondary School. Chairperson of the Swakop Uranium Foundation, Percy McCallum, praised Namibia's growing economy, driven in part by the mining sector. Nam Water this afternoon appointed three contractors to undertake construction of the replacement of the Ogongo Oshikati pipeline. Chief Executive Officer of Nam Water, Abraham Nehemiah, revealed the bidding process for the 51.6 kilometer project commenced on the 15th of January this year and concluded on the 22nd of March. 
The situation is that Namwata has appointed uh, the three contractors that were just um, read out uh, to carry out the um, Ogongo Shagati pipeline replacement and all the um, unsteady works that uh, goes with it. So the bidding process um, commenced on the 15th of January this year and uh, closed on the 22nd of March um, this year as well. And the work um, are divided into three lots as the um, consult con contractors were read out. So we have part A, uh, which is uh, from Ogongo to Oshikuku, uh, which is about 19.7 kilometers. Then we have part B from Oshikuku to um, uh, a transition point at uh, Onangombe, which is about 14 kilometers. And then part C, which is from Onangombe then to Oshakati. Uh, which is 17.9 uh, kilometers. Now you will understand why the, the figures for the con various contractors are different because of the distance as well. They are not covering the same um, uh, distance in terms of uh, kilometers. So the new pipeline uh, will replace the Ogongo Oshakati pipeline, which was constructed in 1978 and consists of 600 millimeter and 800 millimeter diameter asbestos cement pipes with a total length of 53 kilometers. So uh, one knows even now we are, we are not allowed to use asbestos anymore. So uh, apart from this line being old, uh, we also are trying by all means to get rid of any asbestos pipes that we, we might have at this stage because they're not allowed um, internationally anymore according to the uh, uh, health World Health Organization. This is where the top segment concludes for tonight. Stay tuned for the Business and Economics Roundup with Sport Planet on the other side. Planet is a segment dedicated to all things sport in action. Welcome. Arne Slot says he's not shocked by a stunning start to life in charge of Liverpool as the Reds have stormed to the top of the Premier League and Champions League. The Dutch coach has won 14 and drawn one of his 16 matches in charge in all competitions as the holders have also progressed to the League Cup quarterfinals. Slot appeared to have a tough task to follow Jurgen Klopp but he has built on the solid foundations left by the German after Liverpool finished third in the Premier League behind Manchester City and Arsenal last season. Slot said this at his pre-match press conference ahead of hosting Aston Villa on Saturday. The Reds manager noted surprise isn't the right word I would use because I knew the quality of our team, but quality is one thing to be consistent is a second thing. Liverpool were inspired by the power of the Anfield crowd to come from behind to beat Brighton 2-1 last weekend to move two points ahead of City at the top of the Premier League. A staying atop the English Premier League. Ainge Pastor Koglu believes Tottenham are making progress but says any judgments on his work should wait until the end of the season. The Australian has experienced a roller coaster start to his second season in North London. A run of one win from Spurs Open in four games was followed by five consecutive victories, including an impressive 3-0 win at Manchester United. Pastor Koglu's men have since scored impressive home wins over West Ham, Manchester City and Aston Villa, but have lost their past three away games. Spurs sit seventh in the Premier League, but are well placed to progress to the knockout stages of the Europa League and face United in the League Cup quarterfinals next month. Pastor Koglu today said on the eve of Ipswich's visit, there's still a hell of a long way to go and for us, what's important is we keep progressing in the way we have been. 
Postacoglu made changes for Thursday's 3-2 Europa League defeat to Galatasaray with a number of key players out injured. Stay tuned for your sports roundup. This is where we dock for the week. Many thanks for having cruised with me during the course of the week. Another primetime news edition beckons on Monday next week, so do make sure you join us. Before I say goodbye, a reminder to our first-time viewers to follow the on-screen prompts. In order to be subscribed to our channel and be informed of events shaping the domestic, continental and global landscapes. That's it from myself, Michael Madimba, and the zestful crew behind the scenes. Have a blessed weekend. Good night.